Welcome to the Clunatics Podcast. I'm Kurt Graves. I want you to close your eyes and imagine a scene. Unless you're driving. If you're driving, just imagine the scene. But also pay attention to the road and other cars and don't miss your turn or anything. Okay, picture this. You're at a chic, trendy cafe for Sunday brunch. Suddenly, over your shoulder, you hear a familiar voice. Then another. And another. It's almost as if there's a table of your favorite audiobook narrators sitting right next to you. You peek over your shoulder. Holy shit, there is a table of your favorite audiobook narrator sitting right next to you. Right there, in the flesh, is Michael Leslie, Sean Crisden, Greg Tremblay, Daniel Henning, and me. Yes, I'm casting myself as one of your favorite narrators in this fantasy. I'm the host. I have to be there, so just go with it. Michael, Sean, Greg, Daniel, and I are sipping mimosas and talking about TJ, our work, and for some strange reason, we even offer some advice to people who might be eavesdropping on our conversation. Well, guess what, dear listener? This fantasy is real. Or at least the conversation is real. The table at a trendy cafe and the mimosas are just in your head. Unless you mix yourself a cocktail right now. Again, not you, carpool mom. Your day drinking can start after the minivan is back in the garage. Everybody else, sit back, relax, and enjoy the inaugural Clunatics Narrator Roundtable. Hey guys, uh, so first of all, I just I want to thank all of you guys for taking the time to be here today to talk about TJ's work. Uh, I'm going to start by just letting you introduce yourselves and telling us a little bit more about the work you've done for TJ and uh, anything else about uh, your work or career that you want to highlight. Hi, so I'm Greg Tremblay. Uh, the the uh, only book that I've actually done for TJ was um, The Bones Beneath My Skin, his science fiction uh, investigation into what it is to be human and uh, whether you have to be human to be human or or indeed if if sometimes you're more human not being human, um, which was a nice science fiction, um, semi-hard investigation into things that was a delightful book and uh, really plays to a lot of what I love to do as a narrator. I do quite a bit of science fiction, quite a bit of romance as well. There's a little bit of romance uh, in that book as well. So I've I've also been recently working on things like Neil Shusterman's uh, Arc of a Scythe trilogy, which is in the uh, YA post dystopian kind of world, and um, I'm also currently working on a, a series called Opus X for uh, Dreamscape Media. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Leslie. Um, I've worked with TJ on uh, I guess the At First Sight series and Tales from Verania, or. Uh... Destiny, fuck yeah! It's the original name of the series. I kind of hold on to that name, even though it's not the um, I don't know, pro- uh, the professional <laughs> version of that name. I, and um, yeah, and I did How to Be a Movie Star, which followed How to Be a Normal Person, and I'm currently working on The Extraordinaries. Hi, I'm Daniel Henning, and I had the distinct pleasure of being able to narrate The House in the Cerulean Sea which may now be one of my favorite books of all time. Um, and, uh, and I am a narrator. Uh, I've done about, I have about, I'm about to record my 51st book. Uh, and I do work between nonfiction and fiction. Um, and uh, fiction scares me to death. So this uh, House in the Cerulean Sea was actually one of my most frightening experiences and most wonderful. <laughs> I am Sean Crisden. I am audiobook narrator, voiceover guy video games, commercials, all the, whatever I can get my grubby mitts on because I like keeping the lights on. Uh, (laughs) Been doing this now for 10 years, you know, just about 10 years and working with TJ, I think, I think that was 2011 because it was Bear Otter and the Kid. Um, So it was, it was really early, relatively speaking in in my career. And uh, it really, that book, I remember that book pretty specifically, and it, it really s- raised the bar in terms of uh, the quality of writing, the, the quality of the characters and their arcs and development. And because you, I've narrated over 400 books, and in that sphere, 
Uh, there have been books of varying quality and varying intent and varying prose and skill. Um, and TJ is definitely at the top of that in terms of his ability to weave a story and have these believable, endearing, funny, flawed characters that every time I was able to do one of his books, or I was offered to do one of his books, I never even needed to consider it. I said, I don't even need to know what it's about. Yes, yes, because it's it's such a joy to be able to narrate that type of material. It's so interesting to hear that coming from you, who, I mean, you are so established uh, and you've, you know, Audi nominated over here. Like you've got quite a resume. I mean, there's two of us who really, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I, our very first audiobooks were TJ Klune. Wow. And so oh, you our, just, just hit the ground running. Well, we came to learn, right? Yeah. You know, uh-huh. so we uh-huh. got this, this, um, right out of the gate, we got this, this great work. And then we kind of then found our way into the market. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got to find what the, a lot of the majority of the work was like. Especially as a newcomer. Yeah. When you don't, you don't get to really pick what you're doing. Right. You just have to hope that somebody, anybody picks you. And so um, for me, I mean, it was a, a big blessing, but it's so interesting to hear you talk about that like, even 10 years ago when you were starting and it was mm-hmm. still, you know, when you were a new narrator and establishing yourself that, that, uh, that you were able to recognize the quality of his work. Uh, and then there's Michael and I over here who are all like, uh, TJ gave us our careers. So Michael, why don't you, why don't you tell that story? Um, yeah, so uh, starting out, there was a, a site which most narrators know about, uh, might be introducing podcast listeners to, called ACX, which is a subsidiary of Audible. It uh, sort of linked together uh, amateur freelance narrators and um, small publishers, self-published. It still is an operation. A lot of uh, authors still use it. And back in its early days... Uh, as an incentive program, they had um, these books that were potentially going to be bestsellers uh, that came with a, a stipend contract. So you got $100 per finished hour in addition to royalties on the book. That's that's like <laughs> not necessary information. But uh, these were like um, really, they're usually like interesting books because uh, they had the potential to be bestsellers. And um I would just throw narrations at them like darts uh, blindly. I wouldn't say completely blindly, maybe like blocked by the sun. And um, and I submitted an audition for Tell Me It's Real. It was one of the first contracts that I submitted to. And, um, and then I let it be. And a couple of days later, the voice of Paul just popped into my head because the original audition for that book was... It was pretty blank. It was before I really embraced, I think, like taking a risk with narration. I Maybe that sounds grandiose, but like, I, I don't know. I went back and I re-recorded it and I just had a lot of fun with that audition. And even though my equipment setup wasn't very good and I was just starting out, I got it. And yeah, it was like TJ's book, TJ's like writing voice r- really paired uh, well with what I found myself capable of doing in that book. So it was, yeah, as Kurt said, like a launch pad for, I would say my entire career at this point. Nice. So that kind of segues nicely into uh, my next question. So Michael, I'll let you just kind of keep talking about it. Um, You know, what was your first impression of TJ's work and how does it kind of compare and contrast with the work you've done since you started working with TJ? I have to say the very first book uh, or line of tell me it's real is the character of Paul saying, I don't have a gargantuan penis, which was like, <laughs> it's the very first line. And so, and that's in the, the audition, um, the way that the auditions, the way that that audition was displayed, it was just like the first chapter of the book. So I, I remember that just being like a, a kind of a hurdle to, um, to get over. Cause I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Uh, cause it's like crazy. It's a crazy first line, but it's like, it's just an authentic real line. And it's like, that's, mm-hmm. that was what the revelation of coming back to that audition was. I was just like, oh, this is a fucking character, like straight up. 
it starts off, it just jettisons into being a full-fledged character. Like you just, if you can embrace the character from that first line, the first line's like a signal to what the whole tone of the book will be. And uh, and that line, I mean, that line was uh, hugely implicative uh, of of my like, I don't know, treating of the book. Because I, I would call it the gargantuan penis book. Uh, ironically, you know, because he says he doesn't have one. Um, but I mean, like, yeah, that that was literally like the first impression. And it's the first line of that book. And, and it so works. Perfect. I mean, like, he, I think that he does a really good job of introducing tonality just immediately. It, it just like gets out there. And then, you know, you know what world you're in, I think, faster in a TJ book than um, a lot of authors. Yeah. Yeah. So, Greg, how about you? Uh, did you have a gargantuan penis moment? You know, the, so my actual first introduction to uh, to TJ's work was when the audition for Lightning Struck Heart came up, um, because a number of us auditioned for that, and you know we all brought our own take to it, and um, you know obviously certain people brought more what TJ was after for that, and um, I you know I thought that the the writing was fascinating when I first saw that I was I was reading the you know the way that he had crafted this this romping farce and i thought that was fascinating um i also saw how to be a normal person go by and the writing voice was completely different in that it was uh, it, it was markedly different and so then when tj and i sat down in in denver and he he kind of let me in on this book idea and what it, what it was going to be like and i said well that, that sounds sounds awesome um, you know, he, I think he told me it was basically going to be kind of like a uh, an X Files, um, you know, road trip ish sort of sort of book, and I was like, yeah, but yeah, send it along, let's take a look. And once again, the voice was completely different, and um, I went out and I looked a little bit at some other TJ books because I hadn't really had the chance to to take in a lot of them. And quickly discovered that, uh, generally speaking, except if you're in a series, if you've read one T.J. Klune book, you've read one T.J. Klune book. Um, that there was there was a, a oftentimes a, a great degree of difference in the narrative voice in them. And Bones Beneath My Skin was really striking in its um, slightly noir spartan language it was it was very descriptive but not flowery at all uh, the the all of the scenery is painted very 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 evocatively and yet without without any fanfare and without any sparkles it was a very very real book which i think set it off beautifully because the the content has some fantastical in it but all of the the setting is very real and it reminded me a little bit of uh, Stephen King's Firestarter, you know, in that there's a little of the running from the government kind of feel to it. And, you know, it's a little bit X-Files and it's a little bit, uh, you know, a little gritty and, and so, so very, very real. And so very, very different from the narration scripts that I had auditioned with. Uh, so that was really fascinating to me. It was Bear Otter and the Kid. That book really left a, a strong impression on early impressionable narrator me. Uh, just because it was so well done, it was so well written, and it was so much fun. It's 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 difficult to to deal with a lot of the titles that we get, and really really enjoy them on every level because maybe some are dealing with themes that we know are dear to us and important, or some have characters that we love, but the the story, the setting, or the pace may not exactly work for us in, with that. But it was just the perfect mix of of everything. And it, it's really uh, a rare thing, as most folks who listen to audiobooks or if you read or even if you enjoy whatever media you're consuming, to see something that just really pushes all your buttons the right way and all the switches are flipped appropriately. And say, oh, that was good. You know, where you, you, you really can't detract much from it, other, aside from, you know, nitpicking little teeny things or something. But it, it's, it's really, that's one of the reasons why TJ's work in particular uh, always, always, always is a absolutely. You don't. You want to read it? Want this? Nope. I just nope. I will absolutely do it. 
I would love to talk a little bit more just about your since this is your first TJ Klune book and it's the yeah. first it's the first TJ Klune book that you've read. Um, yes. Like so your first impressions are pretty fresh. Oh, yeah. You know, so tell me more just about the book and like how you felt as you picked it up and were reading it the first time and what your impressions were of the story and, and his writing. Well, I had um, so I had uh, I had in the past year or year and a half, I guess, um, I've actively very, very hard and very specifically um, set out to, you know, really meet the producers and the publishers. Um, I know that there are different ways that people do audiobooks and different, you know, people who do like ACX and do and, uh, you know, and make a lot of money off royalty share and all that, which is great. I, I think running my own theater for 30 years and, you know, I think that's partially like I sort of have um, sated that part of me. So I don't feel like I want to like be putting myself out and like, let me try and see if this works. It was more like at this point in my life, I needed to find something that I knew could work. Um, and so I, so I really reached out to publishers and really made an active, um, uh, an active, uh, uh, path in that for myself. And, and I met, um, uh, Thomas Smith at Macmillan and, um, he was so lovely and, you know, listened to my samples and immediately, like the second he listened to my stuff, he wrote me back and he's like, you're amazing. I love your voice so much. He's like, I have a book for you. And this was in like April of last year. He's like, I have a book for you in winter 2020. And I was like, oh, great. Uh, okay, great. And he didn't say what it was. And there was none of that. And then, and then, you know, he finally reached out to me in the fall. He's like, okay, we're, we're ready to do this. And, you know, he's like, but would you mind recording a little sample of it for me? And I was like, no, not at all, of course. And he sent me the first chapter, just the first chapter, which by the way, is, it has a lot to do with the rest of the story, but it's none of the characters except for Linus. <laughs> They're all different characters, you know? So like it's, there's this first chapter, there's everything else. And I got that and I, you know, and I just knew immediately like what it needed to be and who these, you know, I could feel all of the tone. I could feel all of the energy of this thing, still having no idea where this story was actually going to go. Um, and so I did the first chapter. I recorded the whole first chapter for them. Um, and, uh, and, and Thomas came back and he was like, yeah, this is it. This is, you literally nailed this. Um, and in fact, that audition is the first chapter of the book. I did not re-record that. Um, because he was like, there's no reason for you to redo that. You just nailed it. So then, so I had this sense of what this thing was, but not really, because you don't know, books change. Like, you know, and then I got the rest of it and I was like, oh yes, it just, the natural, my natural connection to that story was so, um, it was so, um, deep and specific and I just kind of got it immediately. And I, I, I loved the world that I was being drawn into again with no, I didn't know TJ. I didn't know his work. I didn't, you know, so here was this thing and it was, and it was like, it was coming alive in my hands, you know? Um, and so I feel like in a way, um, the journey of the book and then also kind of the later journey of now the Cluniverse and, you know, and finding out about all of you wonderful people out there in the dark, as Norma Desmond would say, <laughs> um, uh, I feel a little bit like Linus's journey through the book, you know, it's like now I'm meeting all of these, I'm meeting Chauncey and Lucy and except they're real life people like you and people on Twitter. And, you know, um, so it's been a, it's been a, it's been a very magical, no pun intended, um, journey for sure. That's so, uh, you know, we all have different journeys, but I've never heard that before. Like, that's it's so rare that you get the chance to like meet someone, send them some samples and they send you work like, yeah, that is. Yeah, that's great. Because that. Yeah. That if anybody is out there listening to that and thinks, oh, that's how you become a narrator. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. And it's no. again, you know, like, like I said <laughs> earlier, it's like it's like 30 years of of who I am as an artist that has added up to me being able to do, to have an experience like that, right. you know? Right. Um, so it, even though I didn't understand I was training all that time, I in fact absolutely was, you know, and bless, bless Tom for, you know, for, for getting it, for hearing it. He obviously had that book and was looking and wanting to find the right thing. And then, 
you know, it, it, there was absolute kismet in it too, for sure. You know, that he, when he heard my voice, he had that book on his desk and, you know, and he went, oh, wow. And what, you know, one of the things I've talked to, um, a, a lot of the, the publishers that I've been lucky to work with and, you know, cause it's such an interesting business in so many ways, but not the least of which is they'll, you know, they'll all say, well, what kind of work do you like to do? You know, if you're an actor on TV, you don't get that question. You get a job on the sitcom or you don't like no one cares what you want to do. <laughs> you know, it just is yeah. right. Yeah. Um, well here they kind of do. Um, and so I, um, I, uh, let's see, was it, uh, I guess almost two years ago now in 2018, um, I was honored by the California state legislature for, um, pride month, um, for my work, um, in, um, the community and in, um, supporting young artists over my life. And it was, uh, one of the greatest moments of my life. I mean, I'm from California. I'm, I, you know, was born and raised here in a time when it wasn't okay to be gay and, um, and, you know, and, and, and you would be bullied and ostracized and, and I got all of that in spades. And there I was in the middle of the California state legislature being honored because I'm gay and what I've done with that. I, I, I couldn't believe that that was existing in the world. And so I use that story to talk to a lot of the people that I've been working for at, at Audible and and other places to say it's really important to me that um, that there are LGBTQ stories being told um, and uh, and I wanted to if I was going to lend my voice to um, to all kinds of books. Um, I definitely wanted to make sure that my voice was being used um, to to give the little gay kid in Iowa who doesn't know anyone around them who is LGBTQ, and they probably do, they just don't know it, um, who feels alone and separate from the rest of the world. I, if I was going to use my voice for something, I wanted to be able to use it at least partially for that. Um, and people have responded to that and I've had a chance to do some pretty cool stuff as a result of that. And uh, that's not a job. That's just, that just needs to be done in the world. And so I'm, I'm glad I get to be that. That's awesome. At times. I'm asked all the time if while I'm reading one of TJ's books, because they are so good, if I ever get swept away by the emotion, do I ever have to stop to cry or laugh? Have you ever had to stop to cry or laugh? Absolutely. And I mean, a lot of laughter. I'm a hard cry, but I'm an easy laugh. Uh, so I let's see. Did I get any tears? Tears, tears, tears. Why we fight, really? And that was the most recent one. That was Corey's story. That was. Uh, I didn't. You know, I wasn't sobbing, bawling, but it, it definitely. Uh, I teared up a, a few times because it's it's very relevant to, especially in, in the climate we're currently existing in um and tj has a way of crafting the scenes and and building them with the appropriate amount of tension and the appropriate gut punches when necessary and you really 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 feel for the characters their plight and everything that's going on and so i won't say i was sobbing i i'm, I'm but uh, I've definitely had had some tears flowing and and the laughter, of course, there are times I've had to stop because, you know, you know, we, we know what's in the book and we're, we're reading it. And as we narrate it and then you get to a line or an exchange that just, you know, I laugh and I have to stop. OK, let's let's fix that. Where It's just so funny that uh, it, 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 you you fall out of your professionalism because it's it. And again, it. I guess it's in part due to our professionalism that you feel like you're there and you're a part of it. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. He's really good at that. Uh, like we, we said before, his, his dialogue is really good. It's really natural. It flows really well. And it's funny and it doesn't have to be, don't, don't think you have to be a funny guy, TJ, you know, write the story, but it, it doesn't feel contrived funny. It, it's, it just flows. Were there any moments where you had to stop yourself in the booth to either laugh or cry? I almost never. I, I don't I don't ever remember stopping to laugh. Um, and I, I think that 
that just comes from some natural tendency toward delivering comedic lines in my life. But I stop to cry frequently. And I definitely stopped to cry during uh, Bones Beneath a couple times. There were just absolutely moments where that was what was coming up. And I, I think the reason is that when things are funny in a book, it's almost never that the character is laughing. The character is either setting up the joke or the butt of the joke. And we don't we don't really tend to see a character caught up in in hysterics. And uh, and if so, they don't usually play that long. But tears, moments that are really poignantly tugging at the, the depths of our heart are moments that the character is viscerally experiencing. And so that, because it's, it's that, that empathy that I have for the character, that tends to put me more into the, uh, the empathy crying than the empathy laughing. That's fascinating. I, I share that experience. I don't tend to laugh very often, but I do sometimes have to stop for the emotion. We tend not to be, tend not to be impacted the same way as a, as a recipient because we're, we're a participant. I guess so. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean do, you, do you find yourself laughing? Do you have to stop and do <laughs> retakes because you're laughing? Well, yeah, uh, okay. a lot. I, I mean, I would say that that might have to do with the content of the material, as you know, as you were saying. Like TJ uh, writes different um, mm -hmm. genres, I guess, uh, or uh, really like tones. And I'd say that the books that I've been handed are usually uh, more comedic than I think Bones or. Uh, um, Green Creek series. Uh, so I I would say that that approach as far as like laughter versus crying, it probably is like flipped by bias. Um, I have cried with a TJ book, but I mean, like it's it's a really strange cry. Like the, the time I can actually remember it was um, when Vince. Uh, Vi uh, so in the third book of the Afro Sight series, Vince and Paul get married and uh, near the end, you know, Vince sell says his vows. And he's a pretty ridiculous character in my eyes. Uh, mm. And so it's it's really difficult to uh, to to ha to give so much heart and, and real gravity to a character that's pretty absurd. Um, but, you know, I do think that. This author, TJ, TJ does a pretty good job of like knitting those together in a way that is uh it's just super difficult it's super difficult to make like a one dim he's not one dimensional but like a, <laughs> a a limited dimensional character um that uh have that much depth and and that was a scene that i really remember of being like wowed by how much i was carried away by the heart of that character who up until that point really had just been like comic relief I'm going to keep moving on with the with the, some of the prepared questions I had, because I think this is something, again, that I get asked a lot uh, by people who are interested in doing narration work or people who just really enjoy narration work. And I think there are so many different approaches uh, to what we do. Um, and I'm often surprised, too, by people's favorite narrators when they'll like list them. Because mm -hmm. they'll put me on a list with people who I think are very different from me. And I'm like, what is it about these performances that appeals to you when, in my mm -hmm. mind, we're so different? Um, but so TJ, TJ's work often has like a pretty sprawling cast of characters. Um, and in much of our work, we have to do, do character voice work. It's sort of the, the standard that's expected of, of us today as narrators. Um, so I'm just curious how you guys approach voicing different characters and how do you maintain consistency with those voices, especially when you're revisiting a series that you maybe haven't narrated in a while? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I haven't done a series for TJ. I've done a number of other series. I just only did the one standalone for TJ. So I'll, I mean, I'll answer that from a sort of general, um, general standpoint. And that is that creating character voices, I find really typically quite easy characters come to me from reading the, the story. You know, I, I read through what the author has written and I get a sense of the character and so within a given story, it's it's almost never a problem for me to to 
to fall back into that character because we're all hanging out doing that story. But between books, um, you know, sometimes it is a little bit difficult to remember who that character was and and re-meet them. And I discovered that for myself, you know, just keeping some some very short voice samples for uh, for different characters works really well. And of course, the only the only trick with things is is particularly in the romance world in the the non contiguous series where it's it's not following two characters, but it's following a group of friends or a you know somewhere. And so then you have a character who was a very minor character in one book that is all of a sudden the the point of view character in another book. Um, for those, I will typically have to go back to the book in my in my archives and go find where that character was speaking and hear what I did. And of course, that's interesting because sometimes those characters are just dropped in with no mm -hmm. introduction and they had to have a voice. So sometimes they got kind of a random voice and then they're introduced three books later with with actual agency and with interaction and backstory and personality and sometimes vocal descriptions that don't match what I did the first time. And those become a, uh, you know, really a judgment call. And frequently what I will find myself doing is leading into the voice at the beginning of the story much closer to the first way that I did it. If, if there is a, a marked change and then letting it drift a little bit closer to where the change is, is described. Uh, hmm. you know, if it's something really, really major, like, oh, 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 she's Irish. Of course, I, I should have known that three books ago. Um, <laughs> then, you know, then we have to kind of come up with some some decisions. And, I, you know, I've done things literally with those sorts of characters where, um, you know, I, I, it's always fun to meet people in, in the real world who have interesting, non-specific accents. I was talking with a guy just a couple of weeks ago um, in Boston who had a, a very, very mid-range sort of American Midlands diction, except that he would talk to me about whether you could get anything you wanted changed in this in this model. And hmm. and I said, so when did you leave the West Coast of Ireland? And he said, oh, uh, 40 <laughs> years ago, you know, because, but that that is a West Coast Irish thing, ting, everything, you know, a thousand words, a picture is worth a thousand words kind of thing. And so he still had those. And so you can start to, you know, those are things that can that can influence and and inflect uh, a character if you discovered something that you had no way of knowing that then you can kind of start to drift a few of those in there. But Michael, how do you do? Oh, um, I'm excited because uh, I think a lot about this exact thing that you just brought up at the panel that we did at the Denver GRL. Uh, Greg, you had mentioned how th the exact thing that you would just explain, like a very minor character in book one came back and was like a major character in like book four of some series. And he talked mm. in this way that was really difficult for you to talk in, like like a really low range or something. It was an alien. Yeah. 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 I uh, hey, it was a lizard alien. What was yeah. the, what was the voice like? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. He he would speak like this, Captain Stranger, <laughs> and then he had a lot of lines in book three. I yeah, like, really? Really? I love that really? story. Uh -huh. uh huh. I honestly think about that story a lot, um, and it's made me like uh, pretty obsessive about uh, keeping track of voices. Uh, that and. When I uh, came back to Verania, um, so it did Lightning Struck Heart, and then like I think it was almost exactly two years later, that or maybe three years later, I can't, I can't remember now, where book two came out. And so uh, revisiting that, I kind of, um, I didn't do as diligent of a job of really capturing voices, not like I do now. And so I tried mm -hmm. to approximate as best as I could, you know, like, aspects of my own voice had changed um i think at this point mm. in my mm -hmm. career i could match but at that time it's just like i didn't even realize it until the review started coming out but i had changed um an aspect of how i was doing gary the unicorn who's like uh everyone's favorite character and um i don't really regret it because i do think that i i feel like i improved upon the character and it like grew mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I get self-conscious about that because it's the type of thing that like affects reviews and affects people's experience. Daniel, what about you? It's only just been in the last couple of years that I've come back to acting. 
So, uh, you know, I've been looking at things as a director and a producer in the sort of big picture way, which actually helps me as an audiobook narrator, um, because I can see story before I even see like the sentence, you know? Um, so it's a good skill to have, but you know, the idea of doing, you know, 25 characters that all have to be, you know, differentiated and, um, and separate from each other, uh, is, uh, is a daunting task. Um, and, uh, and so that's partially what scares me about doing, um, fiction, um, is, is that, but every time I come to that moment and there's a, like this job, which they had talked to me about, like, I don't know, eight months before I actually got the job. It's like, well, okay. Uh, I'm not sure if I can do this, but they've asked me to do it. So they think I can. So, Okay. (laughs) <laughs> and there's enough of your DNA that's an actor to know you don't say no to a gig. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I really, I, 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 the, the challenge frightens me, but it also, um, but it energizes me and it, and it makes me sort of push myself to places that, uh, I, I don't know that I would have gone, you know, without that kind of impulse. Absolutely. And, you know, TJ does not like to take it easy on his narrators. He don't <laughs> He'll, you know, why have three kids when you could have seven? Well, you exactly know. right. You know, and uh, I mean, luckily, these 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 characters in this book are so clearly delineated, you know. Um, so it was sort of, you know, it was sort of easy in a certain way um, to do that. Uh, uh, I'm, I'll say this out loud because I don't think she'll ever hear this podcast. But my next door neighbor is sort of a, a crotchety old woman. Um, and I'm reading this book. I'm like, oh, this is my next door neighbor. So I sort of gave her, um, Mrs. Clapper, I sort of gave her my next door neighbor's voice. (laughs) So, uh, because it was so clear what he, you know, how he creates these characters, each one of them are so distinct. It, it, the, the, the voicing of them actually sort of came easy in a certain kind of way. So what's your approach to characterizing voices and how do you keep them consistent? And, you know, you had to had to do that break from book one to book three. So, you know, how how do you go back into the the world of a, a series that you haven't done in a while and and still somehow bring those voices back? Well, there there's a my whole process is I have a prepper prep the books for me, and then they basically create a Cliff Notes version of it with character breakdowns and chapter by chapter summaries, and um. When I start the book, <clears throat> pardon me, I'll, I'll look at that and I get a sense of the pacing and everything that's happening within the world and who the characters are. And typically I will create at least a one or two sentence blurb that I'll record once the characters are established. So then I can always refer back to my audio file of, okay, here's these characters and their pace, their tone, the pitch, the rhythm in which they speak, the inflections that they use. Um, any textures or accents or dial, dialects that are used. And I also have a spreadsheet that I'll just kind of write it out, just sort of roughly. So, that, And it's all this weird <laughs> shorthand that only my brain understands with all these abbreviations for um, various elements of it. But that's uh, how I create the, the character when I keep track of them. It's the same thing really for animation and, and video games. It's like, how do you make a character? And the great thing with with TJ's work and authors like him is that you don't have a lot of work to do. <laughs> you don't, it's, it's there for you. It's there in the narrative. So it's really easy to, to feel your way into who these people are and that he, he, he makes my job so easy. Oh boy. Another reason why it's enjoyable yeah. as a narrator, you know, he really does. Uh, I didn't have to learn how to create a character until much later. <laughs> Cause his, his characters, I just heard in my head, you know, mm-hmm. and people are like, Oh, how did you come up with a voice for blah, blah, blah. I was like, I don't know. That's how he wrote it. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, because it all can, it, it all gels together really well. You don't have all these sort of disparate ideas of a character that, that create this, this murky feeling. Of, uh, I think they're sort of, we, we have some pretty clear ideas of, of his characterization. Yeah. So it, it, it's easy for us. It's easy for the listeners and readers, you know, to, to really. And that's why it's it's like a portal <laughs> into the world. And then then you're there in the big green monstrosity or w- whatever book you're listening to. And, and you're 
it's an it's an easy trip. You know, there's no turbulence. It's just oh, I, oh, I got right through security. You know, it's that sort of thing. I think TJ is also incredibly <laughs> helpful in that he doesn't try to be helpful. Uh, hmm. I think he has a really healthy attitude towards his audiobooks, which is that one, he doesn't really listen to them. He, you know, like he'll spot check them just to make sure things aren't like crazy and weird. But he's he's like, I don't really like listening to my own audiobooks. He doesn't like listening to his own writing. Um, and also, he doesn't really feel the need to instruct his narrators to do anything specific. He just kind of lets the work stand on its own. Um, mm-hmm. Because the hardest time I've had as a narrator is when I read the book and talk to the author, and the author is telling me something that feels so contrary to what mm-hmm. I'm reading on the page. Like, oh, I really always envision them as like this actor. And I'm like, but you didn't write that. Right. And, <laughs> like, and that, that's not what that's I'm getting. A, that's a minefield to narrate as a narrator, to navigate as a narrator. Uh, I've worked closely with a lot of authors on their books, and no one will ever have a, as clear a picture or an idea, ideally, <laughs> as the author. And there's no way that they can translate the clarity of that vision to us as narrators and even to the audience in some cases uh, and outside of to allow it to break free of what's in their mind's eye. Even even the most skilled writers and uh, folks who are just so talented in their prose and able to do this, there are still elements of it that constructed this world and constructed these characters that you cannot successfully convey in words. And, And that's okay because it's so well realized that they, <clears throat> pardon me, they can pull out the elements of it that make sense and that contribute to the story. And then here we are as a narrator now, coming in and interpreting the, the prose, the narrative, and now creating our interpretation of it. So it's an, it's an easy analogy to say, okay, so everyone has seen West Side Story, right? So well, maybe not, yeah, but West Side Story, very popular uh, production. So if you see it on stage, the, the script is the same, but the interpretation is different depending on the director, depending on the cast and the, the actors and themselves and their choices that they make. So you can see it under different productions and different theater companies, and it's totally different, but the script is still the same. So when you think about how an author creates a world and they have so much information in their head about the, the characters and the plot points and all the events that are happening and they create the story. And then we, as a narrator, re, narrator, we read it and we make a determination. Okay. This is my interpretation of this. So now it's an interpretation. So we're creating a lens through which the listeners get to see this work, you know, especially if they haven't read the book for themselves. And when you work with the, uh, the author, when I, a lot of times when I'm in communication with authors, I, I'm, rather quick to tell them uh, that there will be a a disconnect between what's in your head. It's, it's unavoidable, you know, so I need to manage their expectations, especially if it's their first time in audio. Well, like you said, I imagine this character is uh, Patrick Stewart and, and this character is, you know, Morgan Freeman and okay. Um, But like you said, it wasn't written that way. You know, the, the character you imagine as Patrick Stewart is a 13 year old, you know, African, you know, a Nigerian girl. I, 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 but it's, it's, so that translation is, can be tricky. And that's where we as narrators, that's what we bring that's unique to our work in that it's, it, it is our interpretation. That's one of the things as a narrator that, I guess we can think of as sort of the ultimate power trip. In many cases, uh, we are now, we receive the script. So now we're the director, we're the assistant director, we're the production manager. We are every single talent that is in the production. We are the background, we are the scenes, we are the Foley, we are all of these things. So we get to do it all, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. But we have to be, careful in our choices so that we honor that script, we honor the narrative, and we try to embody the intent of the author. And that's, I think that's the the biggest skill of narration. You know, narrating is such a fascinating mix of things that you have to be doing all at once. You're, yep. you're reading ahead, you're talking, and you're also listening and assessing all yep. at the same time. Um, 
and in and if any one of those things isn't happening organically it totally messes you up it gave me at least that's my experience the second i start thinking about like oh isn't it amazing how i'm doing this right now yeah no and then you're right yeah yeah Yeah. it it gave me it gave me a an extra appreciation for what uh drum kit players can do right you know here's here's like you know hi-hat your snares and toms and cymbals and bass drum and and you're doing something different with every foot and limb and i'm like okay that's what we're doing mentally is there's part of my brain that's reading what i'm reading right now there's part of my brain that's looking at what's coming up there's part of my brain that's assessing what i just said there's part of my brain that's listening for um you know whether i had mouth noises or whether there was some ambient noise there's part of my brain you know it's just all these things that are that are going on so it is a it's an interesting degree of parallel processing that happens um one last thing before I let you guys go, unless there are other things you want to bring up, which you certainly may. Um, but I do know that there are several people in the Clunatics who aspire to be narrators, who aspire to do what we do. Do you have any advice for them? Well, I'm, I'm going to try to distill a little bit because I don't, I mean, I could I could talk about this for for the better part of three hours if we really yeah. wanted to sit down with it. Um, I, I guess here here is my, my core synthesis of this. Um, you must be at heart, a reader. You know, you you need to, to approach this from a reader's standpoint. You need to be somebody who listens to audiobooks. You need to be able to listen with a critical ear and identify not just if you liked something or not, but why. Why something worked for you or did not. And you will find very much, you know, I, Kurt mentioned a while ago, there was sort of the concept of it's amazing that people can just like love all these very, very different narrators and very different stories. And And yes, because a lot of different things still work to tell the story. If you truly love stories, if you can can hear them critically and you can read them critically and and see where things work and where things do not work, um, I think what you need to bear in mind is that there will be a leapfrogging of many things in the performance as an audiobook narrator. You will have times where your ability to deliver the material um, is is surpassed by the quality of the equipment that you're working with, um, or is surpassed by the quality of the material that you're that you're trying for. These will all kind of they'll move forward at different times. So be honest with yourself about things that are working and things that are not, and do not get bogged down in any single metric for what is and is not success. So yeah, it's long form narration and you need to have the stamina for it and be able to read, obviously, and be able to tell a story. But really it's translating that story that, that's on the page for you. And it's what I tell folks. I, I've taught a few workshops and I have some private students. They say, well, how do I do these audiobooks? Say, well, it's really about be a learning how to be a storyteller and, and that translation from the narrative to what's coming out of your flapping gums and the picture you paint for the listeners and how you weave that together and the choices you make within it to imply now there's implications of subtext that may not be explicit within that narrative so you you bring this additional depth to it and you bring this additional color to everything and It can be really tricky. I remember, especially earlier on, I would hear back from the production team or the author themselves. And they'd say, well, I envisioned this character as this. And I, this is, you know, they're not really that angry here. And uh, for this scene, maybe, you know, and you have some things that you made choices for that were based on your interpretation of the narrative. So it can be, it can be tricky. And working that closely with the author, the author has to essentially trust you. And they should, they should just say, and most won't, and I'm not saying this is what must happen, but ideally they would say, do your thing. We selected you to narrate this because we like your choices and your interpretation of things. And I've, I've had to have that conversation with a few authors and say, well, and at this point in my career, you've, if you're selecting me to narrate your work, you know what you're going to get, <laughs> right? So there's a nice catalog of work. You know what you're going to have. Uh, so it's it's a little clearer uh, for for folks to to kind of figure it out from there rather than 
them having to micromanage and handhold and say, well, I want this and we need this for this character because they're concerned about us not interpreting. In- interpreting. They're concerned about us not interpreting the texturation of the the, the bookery. So, uh, they're, you know, they have that concern. So we have to be able to, that that is the the golden ring for us, in my opinion, as a narrator, is translating that to something that is organic and real and believable, even if it already is in the, in the, in the printed form in the prose and the narration, but you have to translate it. And that's the, that's the real skill of being an audiobook narrator. That's the real skill. And the real trick of being somebody who can last in this business might be the diplomacy that comes along Mm. with the scenario that you were just describing. Uh, Absolutely. And, and every, uh, job in the world like the golden rule is don't be an asshole and yeah. you know you have to be somebody that people want to work with regardless of your skill and talent and how right you may be for a part uh but yeah it's the, the it, skill just opens the door mm-hmm. what gets you through the door and allows you to stay are all of the other things that support that and i i talk to a, a lot of people when I've, I've given talks and i i have something i call the sporth method Sporth, S-P-O-R-T-H, where people say, well, how did you do what you did? You know, I was this inner city kid who grew up and didn't have anything. And it's typically prefaced with all the kids I grew up with are either dead or in jail. It was, that's just what I had. And um, what helped me and how I I decided to qualify and quantify what I did to to get to where I am, I said, oh, it's the Sporth method. So in, in essence, it's the S is skill. You need the skill because that gets you in the door. And without the skill, you, you can't really sit at the table, right? So you need the skill. P is persistence. You have to be persistent in your application of the skill and its development. Every You have to get up every time you fall or fail. So failure is a lesson and, and not a flog. The O is opportunity and that you have to realize that opportunity doesn't just come to you. You need to create it. You create opportunities. You, you, you actively participate. You are proactive in, in managing these opportunities. R is resources. So resources is a huge catch-all in the sense that, uh, yeah, you know, you can think of, okay, I need money if I need to go to a workshop or I have to fly here or I have the time to do these things and, and make this work. Do I have the interpersonal skills to navigate this business successfully as an entrepreneur and to actually talk and communicate with people? Do I have a peer network that I can seek advice from and that can encourage me and not be an anchor to hold me back and say, no, 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 you can't, but just says, well, I think you can do that, which is very important. Do I have a mentor? Do I have someone who can help me navigate these things in the direction that I think I I might want to go? Do I have uh, the resources to do what's necessary? So in the case of narration do you have a place to narrate are you do you have facility with being able to at least record and and do punch and roll editing on your own uh do you have some some of the technical skills that are needed to make that happen as well uh so it, it's it's sort of everything in terms of resources and t is time you can give it the time to to happen you know very few things happen instantaneously uh and the h is hunger so you need to want to do it because the hung, hunger is the overriding principle in that if every time you fail or you have to go to learn this skill or you're trying to find a mentor or you're, you're frustrated with something, if you're not truly hungry for it, then you'll give up. You'll find an excuse to give up and stuff. And that, that applies to pretty much everything we do in our lives. So I, I've, I've used that whenever folks talk to me about, well, how did you do what you did, fella? So that I can, because I looked at, well, what were the qualities that I had? What were the the things that I thought about when I went to bed or that I wanted to develop? And, you know, you make the plan and you you try to see it through to the best of your ability. But it's the, all of those things come into play. And, and we have to remember also as narrators, we are entrepreneurs, we are running businesses and how you represent yourself and how you interact with your clients, everyone from the receptionist straight on up to the, who, whoever the talent buyer is matters because we're all human beings and you should represent yourself as a, a kind, courteous, thoughtful human being who has the skill to do what's needed. But also my goal was always to make sure that after my interactions, people felt better than prior 
to the interaction. And especially if they felt better about themselves, because people love talking about themselves and hearing good stuff. You hear me talking, blah, blah, blah. But it's something you need to be cognizant of when you interact with folks that it's about them. It's not about you. You can help. You're here to help them with a problem they may have, which is all they need a narrator. Oh, that's a problem. I'm the answer to. So, but it's not about you. It's about them and what they need. And, and shifting that idea and perspective of how you view it, uh, that's what I did for my business. And it's been very successful. It may be a, <laughs> a confirmation bias at that point where that's what I look at. Oh, yeah, I, I did this. So it's got to work for everyone. So it's always a disclaimer. Your mileage may vary. But uh, it's a it's a way to get people started who are kind of clueless. But just to consider these things um, in the world at large, not just professionally, but in your personal relationships and in how you treat people uh, that try to leave it better than you found it. Not always possible, but yeah, we try. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for for hopping on the call and having this time. Um, I'm very excited to share a lot of what you said with the Clunatics audience. Absolutely. Thank you. This has been great. Well, I, I certainly look forward to, you know, to this, this, what seems like this amazing um, explosion of TJ Clune into the world. So I'm just, I'm thrilled to just watch him just do whatever it is he's going to be doing next. The Clunatics podcast is produced by Susanna Frigo, Louis Garcia, Angela Noel Moan, Sita Rajasingham, Mia Skibaris, John Steiger, and me. Make sure you're following the Clunatics podcast on social media. Join our Facebook group and find us on Instagram and Twitter using at Clunatics Pod. If you like what you heard, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this episode. We'd also love it if you told a friend. We know that there's a lot of financial uncertainty in the world right now, and we want you to know that the Clunatics podcast will always be free to enjoy. But if you want to support the podcast with a financial contribution, hit the donate button at www.clunaticspodcast.com. Anything we collect that exceeds our operating costs for the podcast will be donated to The Trevor Project. Additional information about the podcast, including episode transcripts and the Clune Speak Don't Be a Dictionary, is also available at cluneticspodcast.com. You can find out more about me and my work at kurtreads.com. That's K I R T R E A D S.com. All music and sound effects heard in this episode are licensed by Storyblocks Audio.